Thank you very much. So, first time in Wigan, went to look at the Wigan Pier, was not what I expected. <laughs> um, does everyone have a voice like Pauline in Wigan? And that was extraordinary, really, absolutely extraordinary. And I say that as a, as a big folk fan. Um, I have to apologize to these people first. When I talk, I walk, and I'm really sorry, and there's a reason for that. So, like many people in the ANC, I never expected to become a member of parliament. And soon after we were all elected, I was sent to the US on the first official delegation of the first democratic South African government. And we went to Atlanta. Why? Birthplace of Martin Luther King, who was obviously very close for us because of our struggle. Atlanta is also home to the headquarters of CNN and the Coca-Cola Corporation, which is not something I knew before I landed there. So we get welcomed by the mayor of Atlanta, who was a former professional basketball player. So to someone of my height, he looked about 10 foot 7. <coughs> and he greeted us from behind an illuminated Coke can. <laughs> so my boss at the time was an ANC politician called Tokyo Sekhwale. And Tokyo says to me, Andrew, that was a long flight. I'm tired. You go and thank him. So I walk up the stairs of this illuminated Coke can and I say a few words. Walk back down. And I hadn't worked with Tokyo for very long. So I was a bit nervous. And I said, in chief, was that okay? And he says to me, yeah, what you said was fine. The only problem was all we could see sticking out of the Coke can was a very sweaty, bald head. <laughs> so I've sort of become averse to standing in one place when I speak. And I think that's probably the reason. <laughs> I must say, with all sincerity, it really is a great honor to be here. And thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you to my mate Ian for making sure I was invited here. I don't know what skullduggery was involved in persuading the good people of Wigan to allow me in here, but whatever it was, thank you very much. It also caused me to find out more about the diggers. So what I knew was that the founding principle, the guiding principle, was that the earth was made to be a common treasury for all. That much I did know. But what I didn't know was that the diggers, in the 1600s, were advocating for absolute human equality. Now, when you're a white person who comes from South Africa and grew up during apartheid in South Africa, where you've had nothing but privilege because of the color of your skin, and I should just mention my daughter, when I was first explaining to her when she was quite young about racial classification under apartheid, she said to me, but why did they call you white? You're not white, you're pink. <laughs> and she has a point. And I tried to explain to her that that was just a reflection of the absurdity of the system where her mother and I not only weren't allowed to live in the same area, not only weren't allowed to study together or work together, not only weren't allowed to be in a relationship because my wife is Bangladeshi, we weren't even allowed to drive in a car alone together. What did they think we were going to do in a car alone together? 
I don't know what happens in Wigan in cars. <laughs> <laughs> well, not all there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so maybe one of the architects of the party passed through Wigan at some point. In this life. <laughs> but you know, to come to Wigan, to hear about the role of the diggers, and particularly Gerard, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce the surname, because there seems to be some dispute about how it is pronounced, and I'll get it wrong regardless. So I'm just going to call him Gerard. And to hear their understanding of absolute human equality, that it wasn't just about colour, it wasn't just about class, but it was also about gender. Now, I'm no historian, but in the 1600s, I'm not convinced that gender equality was particularly high on the agenda. So this is extraordinary in the foresight in just how progressive they were. And then even further, I discover that they were really keen on the use of direct action. And that really impressed me, for reasons that I'm going to come back to in a moment. And of course, their action, direct and otherwise, resulted in a brutal response from an elitist state. Now, reading up about this, the tragedy for me is that so little has changed in so long a period of time. I'm writing three books at the moment. One of them was someone you might have heard of, a chap called Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. I live about a 10 minute walk from Germany, and I've known him since long before I moved to the UK when I was involved in the struggle against apartheid, because Jeremy is a lifelong anti-racist. And I look at what has happened to Jeremy, and as I've, because we're editing this book together, we've been seeing far too much of each other. And we'll launch the book in September and hopefully come to Wigan to promote it. It's about campaigning and activism against the global arms trade. And I'm going to tell you a little about the global arms trade today. But I'm then doing another book, which is about the conflicts in Yemen and in Gaza. And how, who profits from it? And how conflict and war is required to keep the, the system of class subjugation in place, and I'll explain a bit more in a bit. And then I'm writing a third one, which is a sequel to a book, my first book that I wrote about my experience in South Africa called After the Party. But the book I really want to be writing is just a very short book, a very simple book, called The Madness of the Moment. And Jeremy is part of the reason for me wanting to write that book, because the way Jeremy's been treated makes me realize that the situation we find ourselves in is that the racists, and unfortunately we have quite a lot of them in our society, and unlike many of us, they tend to be in suits and ties, or pearls and twin sets. The racists now, very loudly, describe the anti-racists as racist. <clears throat> and coming from the background that I do, both as a South African who's seen the very worst of racism, as the son of a Holocaust survivor who lost dozens of her family, mainly in the death camp of Auschwitz, where I've lectured on genocide prevention, I think to myself, this is really upside down. This really is madness. But that applies 
to virtually every aspect of the world we live in now. So, let's take something else. Britain today has more billionaires than at any time in our history. At the same time as that, we have more people having to utilize food banks to feed their families than at any time since the Second World War. In 2024, when we are supposed to be civilized, when we are supposed to have advanced, how on earth can we have these two things side by side? How can we have people who have so much money that if they lived from the 1600s until today, they'd still have hundreds of millions, if not billions, left. What are they going to do with it? They're going to pass it on to their children, many of whom have never worked a day in their lives, to continue to reproduce the inequality and the power imbalance that characterizes the world today. But then, they also have a whole army of people who ensure that they can continue to steal from the rest of us. Because I'm afraid to say, you don't become a billionaire in this world without taking money out of other people's pockets. <coughs> and you won't be shocked to hear that those other people can't really afford to have money stolen from their pockets. And who are these people who ensure that the laws that what we are and aren't allowed to say and do are in favor of those billionaires. Well, I can think of many names for them. But we know them as politicians. <coughs> and I say this as what Al Gore, the former American vice president, would have described as a recovering politician. And of course, there are a few good people who are politicians. We think of Jeremy. We think of Richard, who you've had talking here. We think of Zara Sultana. Mm. And there are others you'd be able to name. But why can we name them? Because they are so few in number, and because they are the exception. Because for the vast majority of them, they are the lapdogs of the billionaires. Now, I live in a place called Camden Town in London, which I love because it's incredibly diverse. When our son was born in South Africa, he's now 25 and he works as a political organizer in Sheffield. When he was born, I was still a member of parliament in South Africa. And the media in the country described him as the country's first Jusla because I'm nominally Jewish and my wife is nominally Muslim. It was nothing of the sort. There were many people in South Africa who were that combination of Jewish and Muslim. Just nobody knew about them, because under apartheid that would have been illegal. So I love that about Cam. What I'm not so thrilled about is that for the last eight and a half years, and we were evicted without cause recently. Before we were evicted without cause, because our landlord wanted to increase the rent by 400%. <coughs> we weren't very polite in objecting. <laughs> Especially since he hadn't sorted out the black mold that had been there for eight of the eight and a half years we lived in the flat. I lived on a road. And on one side of the road was the constituency of Islington North. So I was a few steps away 
from being a constituent of Jeremy. Sadly, my steps were in the wrong direction. And my MP is another guy you might have heard of called Keir Starmer. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but I can see some obvious sort of physical differences between Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak. One of them, by the way, is not their height, because they're both my height. <coughs> I don't know what's happening with all these short men, but I'm not convinced we're good for the world. <laughs> So besides these obvious differences that we can all see, if I look at them politically, if I look at them personally in terms of their values, their principles, their ethics, I was going to say vision, but to suggest that either of these two people actually have a vision, besides the permanent maintenance of power and inequality, I just don't think it's a good word to use. Because really, we could take this piece of paper and we wouldn't be able to force it between the differences between the two of them. What the vast majority of our politicians do today is they represent their billionaire funders and their own personal desire for power and money. And that is it. And you know what? I can survive that. Not happily, but I can survive it. But there are millions and millions of people in our country and in the world who cannot. And that is indefensible. So what is, not the vision that they would espouse to us, but what is the reality of what they impose upon us? First of all, a system of permanent austerity. Can any of you, of whatever age, remember a time when we weren't in austerity in this country? This is the sixth or seventh wealthiest country in the world, depending on what economic metrics you use. And we are permanently in the situation of austerity. And yeah, gee, I'm sure that must be really tough for the billionaires. Of course it's not. And what goes along with the permanent austerity? Or what I describe as forever wars. Can you remember a time when we weren't at war with something or someone? I can't. I spent the last 23 years investigating and writing about and making films about and speaking about the global arms trade, conflict, genocide. And if I lived a hundred lives, there would still be a whole lot more work to do on that. And one of the key consequences of those two things is that we are destroying the earth. We are destroying what has been given to all of us. And conflict is the worst possible thing for our environment. It destroys the natural environment. It forces people to relocate, which in turn has an even more devastating impact on the environment. I remember once when I was writing my book, The Shadow World, you'll be shocked to hear that a company called BAE Systems, the biggest arms company in Britain, featured fairly prominently in the book. So I wrote to the chair of BAE Systems, which at the time was the most corrupt company on the planet, and I said to him, Here's the book. You know what I'm going to say about you in the book because I turn up at your AGM every year and I shout at you. He wrote back and he said, my lawyers tell me I shouldn't speak to you. 
but would you be willing to meet one of my corporate executives? So I go and meet this woman. First, she says to me, we would like your advice. She says, now, they've just done a very corrupt deal in South Africa where they paid 115 million pounds of bribes to some of my colleagues in the ANC. And the reason I live in London and not in Cape Town is because I try to investigate that corruption. And President Thabo Mbeki, our second democratic president, who I'd known since I'd had to first leave South Africa in 1986, wasn't thrilled about the fact that I decided to investigate this corruption. So the night before he was about to kick me out of parliament, I resigned. They paid 115 million pounds to get a deal that they weren't even shortlisted for in South Africa. Four years into our new democracy, and excuse my language, they fucked it up. And the tragedy of South Africa, it's not that we're any worse than anyone else, is that so quickly, after four extraordinary years under Nelson Mandela, in which we showed the world that it's possible to actually run a country in the national good, to run a country for all of its people, that was dangerous. So they corrupted our political system through arms deals. We spent $10 billion on weapons we had absolutely no need of and have never used until today. And this is at the time that our then President Thabo Mbeki said, we didn't have the finances to provide antiretroviral medication to 6 million South Africans living with HIV or AIDS. That resulted in the deaths very conservatively over the next five years. Avoidable deaths of 365,000 South Africans. 32,000 babies every year in those five years born HIV positive because we couldn't afford mother to child transmission treatment. But we could afford to spend $10 billion on arms. And why did we do that? because $350 million of bribes were paid. So the tragedy of South Africa today is how quickly we adopted the awful global political and economic norms. That is the tragedy of South Africa today. So, why, why do we have this permanent austerity, these forever wars, this constant destruction of our natural environment. Well, because the centerpiece of all of that is that we privatize everything. We privatize our public services. The NHS being the most obvious example. There's a young Palestinian woman called Leanne Muhammad standing against West Street in the Shadow Health Center. Let us all do what we can to support her. Because this forever austerity based on privatization of everything that moves, including war. We've even privatized making war. Why? Because that's what enables our politicians, billionaire funders, to get richer and richer and richer. It's a very good system, very good system indeed. And of course, you know, I don't need to remind you, COVID, a 39 billion pound contract <coughs> given to a very nice looking woman because Boris Johnson only seemed to give the billions corruptly to very nice looking <coughs> women. And I have no idea what his relationship to those attractive women might or might not have been. But I do note that like one of our former president, Jacob Zuma, Boris Johnson does not seem to know how many children his father. <laughs> 39 billion pounds to produce a track and trace app that never worked. So did we get our money back? Because I don't know about you, but if I buy a kettle that doesn't work, I tend to take it back and demand my money back. I work on the assumption, though, that whoever made that kettle had 
had some idea of what they were doing. <laughs> had some experience in making a few kettles before they made mine. Well, not this particular person. She never worked in healthcare. She'd been a non-executive member of a mobile telephone company, which means she knew nothing about that either and just made money by turning up for board meetings every now and then. Now, key to this system of permanent austerity, of forever war, destroying our environment, is the war's part of it. Something you might not know, but the buying and selling of weapons, what I describe as the arms trade, accounts for 40% of all corruption in all world trade. 40%. I mean, when one thinks about all of the other corrupt businesses, that's a lot. And what happens to those bribes? So, when Britain decides to sell <coughs> Saudi Arabia a human rights abusing country that was also one of the main financiers, ideological supporters of, and provider of weapons to what during the so-called war on terror we called, and I put this in inverted commas for a reason, Islamist terrorism. And the reason I put it in inverted commas is because my former boss Nelson Mandela was called a terrorist by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan amongst others. Why? Because he wanted to liberate the people of South Africa from the yoke of apartheid. So we sell Saudi 40 odd billion pounds worth of weapons to sweeten the deal because this is how the world works. We pay them 6 billion pounds of bribes. That's with a B. 6 billion pounds of bribes. But not all the bribes go to members of the Saudi royal family. A lot of them do, including 1.2 billion pounds to the son of the Saudi defense minister who did the deal with Thatcher. And when she told him they need a few bribes, she said, anything at all. You tell me what you need. But just in case his 1.2 billion wasn't enough, BAE Systems also gave him a Boeing 707 as his private plane, painted in the colors of his favorite American football team, the Dallas Cowboys, because he liked the look of their chin. And you'll be delighted to know, as taxpayers of this country, that at least until 2017, and only because we haven't investigated beyond that, you and I were paying for the maintenance and running costs of that birthday gift to Prince Bandar bin Sultan. But not only the bribes go to the Saudi royal family or whoever we happen to be selling to that week, some of those bribes come back. So Mrs. Thatcher would not sign the deal until 12 million pounds was given to her wastrel son Mark. Because she didn't want to spend the rest of her days having to give him a lot of pocket money every week because he can't get it together to actually make any money of his own. And believe me, I know, he had to live in South Africa for a while because he wasn't very popular here. And he was convicted both of financial loan sharking and of funding an attempted coup. And so was deported from South Africa with a criminal record which delighted his ex-wife because she's American. So she took the kids and moved back to America because Mark Thatcher is not allowed into America because he has a criminal record in South Africa. But the executives of BAE Systems also get bribes. A little Mayfair flat that in the 1980s was worth six and a half million pounds. Pocket change to you and I, I'm sure. Probably quite valuable. Sir Richard Evans, 
the then chair of the AE system. That's not all. Some of that corrupt money, quite a lot of it actually, gets donated to the main political parties in this country and around the world. So the main arms dealer involved in that transaction, delightful gentleman by the name of Wafik Saeed, after whom the Saeed Business School at Oxford University is named. I was invited to give a talk then. I didn't realize it was the same Mr. Saeed. It's just called the Saeed Business School. So I started my talk by saying, isn't it funny? I spent the last 12 years <laughs> investigating a horrible arms dealer whose name is Wafik Saeed. And the organizer literally pulled me off the stage and said, that's the guy who gave us the million for this building. So I spent the rest of the lecture only talking about him. <laughs> Wafik Saeed was the biggest donator to the Conservative Party until some private equity guy started donating more than him. But since the Second World War, the arms companies have directly and indirectly donated more money to political parties in the Western world than anybody else. And it's not just to the political parties. It's also to the individual politicians. So let's talk for a moment about what Mrs. Thatcher described as her greatest achievement. A chap by the name of Tony Blair. Well, as Claire Short, who was a minister in his cabinet, said of Tony Blair, never saw a war that he didn't like. <laughs> and... By our very conservative calculations, Tony Blair, since leaving office, has made 110 million pounds personally, at least, from the decision to invade Iraq and from his association with British and American defense companies. So Keir Starmer, my constituency MP, knows that even if he gets into office, and only lasts as long as Liz Trust. Do you remember her? <laughs> she was the Prime Minister who managed to serve for 49 days, which cost us 74 billion pounds. I wonder how much of that the billionaires contributed, or whether we are the ones who suffer the cost of living crisis as a consequence of the complete incompetence and stupidity of our political leaders. So, even if Keir Starmer only served for 49 days, he knows that because of the decisions he will take in those 49 days, that will make billions for the arms companies, the banks, the lawyers, the auditors, who act as intermediaries on all of these deals, he will be a multi, multi-millionaire for the rest of his days. And that's why someone like Keir Starmer goes into politics. And that's why when anybody asks Keir Starmer what his vision is for Britain, <coughs> what his aspirations are for Britain, what his hopes are for the world, he has nothing to say. And not only that, he says the nothing in the most boring, bloody way. <laughs> At least it's consistent. Well, yes. <laughs> but let's think for a moment. Let's think for a moment what the consequence of these conflicts and wars are that are making our politicians wealthy, that are funding our political parties to serve us in their selfless, competent, committed way that they are. It is that over the past nine years, over 20,000 innocent civilians have been killed in Yemen, not as collateral damage because they happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, but intentionally targeted by the Saudi-led coalition using British, American, and Western European weapons. So you see how that circle works. And let's just think about the past five months in Gaza. A 
which is the highest <coughs> concentration of human beings per square meter. 32,000 people, almost 12,000 of them children, murdered in cold blood by a racist settler colonial state that isn't as bad as apartheid South Africa was. It's even worse. Mm -hmm. Why? And these are the words of my friend and political mentor, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He says that Israeli apartheid is worse than anything we experienced in South Africa because mm -hmm. unlike in South Africa where the apartheid state, in order to keep the billionaires wealthy and happy, required the slave labor of the black majority in our country. There's no way they were going to slaughter 30,000 of their workforce. Whereas Israel, which doesn't rely on the Palestinians for their economy, because their economy is built on war and what they call homeland security, don't need the Palestinians don't want the Palestinians and have exactly the same approach to the Palestinian people that the South Africans have, which I'm afraid to say, because I say this as a Jew, is based on racist white supremacy. And you know what I find most disgusting of all? Is that they then use the suffering of tens of millions of people, including my mother's family, to justify what mm -hmm. they are doing. Yeah. Now, what does it take to use the murder of 12 million people, 6 million of whom were Jewish, to justify the killing of tens of thousands of other people in, wo in what the world's highest court, the International Court of Justice, has ruled is plausibly genocide. But we don't need to be lawyers. We don't even need to be those incredibly fancy lawyers who sit in the International Court of Justice. We just need to have a computer or a phone to know that this is genocide. And our political leaders and their billionaire funders don't just sit by and do nothing while this genocide is taking place. They actively are aiding and abetting the slaughter of innocents. Why? Because once again, it is our weapons from which they are profiting that are doing the killing. This is a situation I never imagined I would see in my lifetime. So, in concluding, I want to move to think about what we do. What we do about what is happening in Palestine, in Gaza, and what we do about what is happening in our country. Firstly, when it comes to Palestine, of course, we have to keep marching. We have to keep protesting. And I really want to exhort every one of you. There is another national march coming up. Please make sure there are buses and trains from Wigan and make sure that not only you and your family and your friends are on those buses and trains but even people that today you don't know you persuade them to come down we're doing work in my organization which is a very tiny organization called Shadow World Investigations where we do these I don't do these investigations myself I have five other colleagues who I do it with we are helping a group called Workers in Palestine to document on a daily basis what weapons are being used to kill innocent Palestinians. 
where those weapons come from. So we're in touch on a daily basis with people in Gaza and the West Bank. And the trauma, just from these people, is palpable every single day. Every single day. But you know what they say to us? When we're talking about specific incidents, specific bombings, they say to us, please never stop telling people how important it is to us that you on the streets of London, Washington, New York, Paris, Berlin, Madrid, Sana'a in Yemen, where there have been two protests with over five million people at each. Please don't stop telling those people how important that support for us is because that's all that's giving us hope at the moment, is that while the politicians are killing us, the people of their country are supporting us and are in solidarity with us. So please, it is so important that we continue to protest in ever greater numbers. And of course, we're trying to take the defense companies, our governments and others to courts. But we all know I drove past the Wigan and Lee courthouse on my way here. We all know that the courts are part of the bigger system. That the chances of a billionaire who probably stole most of his first tens or hundreds of millions in some way or another. I had a professor at Cambridge who in our first lecture said to us, never forget that behind every very successful business is a successful crime. The courts aren't interested in that. The courts are interested in those people who in order to be able to feed themselves and their families steal a couple of loaves of bread. That's what the courts are concerned with. Because that's how the system works. So the courts are not going to solve this problem for us. We're going to have to solve the problem for ourselves. As we demand a ceasefire, we also have to demand that all arms sales to Israel stop. You know, almost every day, <laughs> almost every day, huge transport plane leaves from the RAF base in Cyprus. The government will not answer a question in Parliament about what is on those planes. But I'll tell you what's on those planes. It's the bombs and missiles and the spare parts for the planes that drop them. So that after killing 300 people today, of whom 120 are children, 55 are women. Their stocks are replenished so they can kill another 300 people tomorrow. Because that's what's happening. And it's being done in our names with our tax pounds. Because BAE Systems, Raytheon UK, Elbit Systems, which is a bloody Israeli arms company that had 10 factories in the UK, and I'll come back to that in a sec are the most heavily subsidized companies in the world. So our welfare state has been destroyed and eroded since Margaret Thatcher, at least for ordinary people. But this country does have a welfare state for the corporate sector and our billionaires, who we subsidize out of our tax pounds. Not that we ever get asked. But then, and this is where I come back to the diggers, and I was so excited to see that they engaged in direct action. I've been working on the arms trade, as I said, for 23 years. Maybe my books and films and other things have educated a few people, maybe not. But I'll tell you what has had the greatest impact on addressing the atrocities of the global arms trade is direct action 
carried out by groups like Palestine Action. And yesterday in Bristol, the Bristol Seven, they became known, including two Israeli citizens who had been found guilty of criminal damage to property at an Elbit Systems factory, were given suspended sentences and walked free. Why? Because even in our weird court and legal system, there are still a few magistrates who are prepared to say, you committed a minor crime in order to prevent a far greater crime. Palestine action has caused the permanent closure of two of Elbert Systems' 10 factories in the United Kingdom. In addition to which, they caused the company to lose a £280 million pound contract with the British Ministry of Defence. Now that has an impact. That has an impact. So in addition to all the other stuff, for those of you who can, and not everybody can engage in direct action, there are a lot of people amongst us who can't afford to get arrested who don't have the physical vigor, and I count myself amongst them, to climb up the side of a huge factory and to break into it with hammers and other equipment. But we can all support them. We can all provide food for them. We can all provide hot drinks for them while they're staking out these factories. And we can all encourage others to get involved in that sort of activity. And then finally, Apartheid ended in South Africa because the vast, vast majority of South Africans made our country ungovernable, even in the face of an incredibly powerful military state that spent 14% of our GDP on the military and the police, and with the support of tens of millions of people around the world including, I would imagine, a few of the older people sitting here, through what we call boycott, divestment, and sanction. And how that worked was when you walked past the supermarket, and rather than buying the outspan oranges that we all knew came from South Africa, you bought the Seville oranges that came from Spain. <coughs> that when you needed to fill up your car, you drove past the Shell garage and you went on to the next one. So this is something we can all do in our daily lives. And what that did is it caused the economy of South Africa to deteriorate. And that resulted in the lifestyle, the quality of life of privileged white South Africans like me deteriorating. And that was when the apartheid rulers knew that the game was out. And that is the only way we are going to get the most right-wing government in Israel's history. A government that is proud to describe itself as fascist, that is proud to describe itself as racist and genocidal. That is the only way we are going to get them to see sense, is if we start boycotting, divesting from, and sanctioning everything to do with Israel. So it's not just what we do and don't buy in the shops. It's that we've all got to. Personally, I think this is a godsend. Not watch the Eurovision Song Contest this year. <laughs> Until they ban Israel. Not participate in sporting events where Israel is allowed to participate. Not participating in cultural events where Israel is allowed to participate. That is the weapon that we, as people, have. And then, finally, how do we take back our own country? What do we do <coughs> about these so-called politicians who represent only their billionaire funders rather than us? First of all, we have to organize. We have to organize as workers and communities. Now, Ian here knows far more about organizing than I will if I live three lives. 
We have to be strong and active members of our trade unions. Because we've seen since Thatcher how the power of our trade unions has been reduced. And the only way that we regain that power is to make them stronger and stronger simply by force of numbers. But we also have to organize in our communities like you are, like the Wigan Diggers Festival, like the For the Many Network, which Ian, myself and Ali were very privileged to be a part of founding at the initiative of Ken Loach, who's spoken to you previously. So the idea of the For the Many Network is like you're doing in Wigan. We create community hubs across the country which communicate with each other about strategies. So that when we've gone through the next election, and the color of the tie of the person who now calls the shots has changed from blue to red, and that is the only thing that changes in our country, <coughs> we are able to coordinate and communicate in the creation of the biggest mass movement from the grassroots up that this country has ever seen. Because unlike when Tony Blair came to power, it won't take us years to figure out what he's really about. When it's Keir Starmer, who doesn't have Tony Blair's charisma, who doesn't have the whole cool Britannia thing going on, and who has already made it absolutely clear to us that he idolizes Margaret Thatcher. Have you noticed the shadow cabinet last week? Obviously, their talking point for last week, how much we love Thatcher. And they think that that's a good thing. They think that that's not offensive to the vast majority of people who live in this country. Just as saying that it's okay for Israel to starve people, to not provide them with water, to not provide them with health services. Which he, of course, now denied. I mean, the guy has kids. Have they not mentioned social media to him? Have they not mentioned the fact that him actually saying those things is available for all of us to watch unedited? That he can't unspeak what he's spoken. This is a guy who, to use the cliche, the only good thing about Keir Starmer is that we know when he's lying. Because it's every time his lips move. I mean, you know, is the guy the most incredible gymnast that the world has ever seen, putting Nadia Comaneci and everyone who came after her to shame. Because to flip-flop as often as he does, without breaking his back, is actually a remarkable achievement. This is a guy who lied his way to the leader, leadership of the Labour Party, who is going to lie his way into number 10 Downing Street, and it is all of us who are going to suffer the consequences. So we need this network. Because the day after the election is the day that the real struggle begins. And what we need to do in the election, because this year we're going to have local and national elections, is we have to use these elections as a staging post for that struggle. The elections themselves are going to be playtime for the politicians to try and get a mandate to continue to make their billionaire funders wealthier. What you have to do during the election, local and national, is ensure that neither you a member of your family, your friends, people you don't yet know. Vote for anybody, for anybody who is in the pocket of billionaires. For anybody who has lied to you. For anybody who does not represent you 
and your interests for anybody who did not call for a ceasefire at the very earliest opportunity. And in your ward, your constituency, if there's no one to vote for, then you get together as a community and you identify someone of your community who you can trust to represent you. Not to become full of themselves because they're sitting on the plush leather seats of the House of Commons, but to represent you. You know, Nelson Mandela once walked into our parliamentary caucus and he said, who here thinks you're important? And he knew that a few people would put their hands up, and they did. And he then said to them, the moment that you think you are more important than the people who elected you here, the people who you represent, the people who pay your salary, that's the point at which you are no use to those people, to this movement, to this country, or to the world. We'd have to get rid of 98% of our public representatives if that was the standard we were applying. But that is the standard we have to apply. Because they have to represent us. And this is what is happening in constituencies and local areas all across this country. And that is why this election is an important staging post. Because most of those independents won't win. Hopefully the one very close to me will. But the vast majority of them won't. But that's not the point. You can have success without victory. What they will do is ensure that your voices are heard in this election. And what we're doing in Hoburn and St Pancras, the constituency of Keir Starmer, and I don't use those three letters that come before his name, and I apologize for that if that offends him or anybody else. But I come from a country that was a British colony. And to honor people in the name of the British Empire is deeply offensive to the memory of what British colonialism did. Not just to my country, but to many, many countries across the world. What we are doing in Keir Starmer's constituency is we are starting the most exhaustive consultative process that there will ever have been in a British election, where every single resident of that constituency will have the opportunity to tell the campaign what the key issues are for them, what they would like to see their candidate, a community candidate, saying about those issues in an election. And on the basis of those things, which is going to take many months to do, a local manifesto will be drawn up. And that will be the basis on which myself, or a better candidate, if there is one in the community, will take on Keir Starmer. And we might not beat him, but he will never forget that he's been in an election. After that election, that is when the real struggle to win back our country begins. And I would exhort each one of you to honor the memory <coughs> of the Wigan diggers. To honor the memory of all those Palestinians who've been murdered with our weapons using our tax pounds. That's what I ask each and every one of you to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew.
Thanks for coming to speak.